Hi everyone and welcome once again to the Latte Lounge. Um, now with October being Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I could think of no better person to interview than the person who is the inspiration behind the reason why I set up the Latte Lounge. Um, not only that, he happens to be a world expert on breast cancer. Um, oh, and also he's my father. So welcome Professor Michael Baum. Delighted right. to be here. As always, I would like to call him dad. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, okay. Hello. Right, so but before we talk in more detail, um, you know, about Breast Cancer Awareness Month and what women should or shouldn't be doing, um, you, you've brought out a new book. I wondered if you can just tell everyone a little bit about, well, first of all, the name of the book and a little bit about why you wanted to write it. Um, well, the book is The um, History and Mystery of Breast Cancer, and uh, that's what it contains. It, takes, it contains a history and explains why it's such a difficult challenge to beat. That's the mystery. Yeah, okay. Um, and obviously, but I want to talk um, a lot more detail about the book, but before we do, can you just tell everyone a little bit about your history, why you wanted to be a doctor, um, in particular, a surgeon specialising in breast cancer, um, and obviously how long you've been practising and right. up to now. Um, I always wanted to be a doctor. I can't remember a time in my life when I hadn't envisaged being a doctor. Uh, that was partly because my oldest brother, the first to go to university in a family, was a doctor, and I admired him enormously. I qualified in 1960, and I became a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons in 1965. And whilst balance of mind was disturbed, I got engaged on that very day, and we moved uh, to King's College Hospital, London, where I started to embark on a career, not only as a surgeon, but as a cancer researcher. So I was already um, doing research, uh, in the late 1960s, as well as operating, when my um, mother was diagnosed with breast cancer and she had uh, bone metastases, she was in agony and she had a terrible death. She actually died on my birthday in 1971. I felt a sense of anger as well as heartbreak I saw breast cancer was an enemy, and how was I going to deal with it? That redirected um, my interest, not just to cancer, but to breast cancer in specific. I qualified um, as a consultant surgeon and became professor of surgery at King's College Hospital in 1980. And right from the start, I set up breast cancer specialist units, and breast cancer uh, research teams and that's from there that's the trajectory that set me on the path to here i mean that's pretty you know i know that story but it's pretty heartbreaking however many times you do <coughs> that um you know something good always comes out of something so horrific um and obviously thank god you know you followed this path um, I want to obviously sort of talk a little bit about what women, you know, we get a lot of women on the group sort of saying, well, what should I do? What should I look out for? My doctor said this, my GP said that. And there's a lot of sort of, you know, fear mongering in, in you know, in the media and various uh, bits of evidence that keeps getting sort of rewritten and confused. And there's a lot of confusion out there. I, and I thought, having delved into your book, you know, myself, that there are a few chapters I would pull out which might actually kind of clear up some of those sort of myths um, in, you know, quite a neat fashion. Um, the first of the chapters, chapter nine, you've called the mastectomy wars. T tell me a bit about that chapter in particular and why it's, you know, you feel it's important to discuss this. Right. Um it's important for two separate reasons. Uh, one, it led to more humane medicine or surgery, and the other, it's kick-started a whole uh, sequence of randomized controlled trials concerning breast cancer based on scientific, not uh, 
the scientific evidence, not the advice of some superhero. There are no superheroes. Now, I said I qualified as a fellow of the Royal College in, in uh, surgery in 1965. In those days, there was no doubt. There was no issue. There was no problem. The treatment of breast cancer was radical mastectomy. The controversy was would you needed to add radiotherapy to it. That's a given, full stop. Well, I never thought it was. Um, and uh, in 19, well, towards the end of the 1960s, 1970, I realized there was only one guy in the world who was challenging this received wisdom and doing something about it. And uh, it was barbaric. I learned to do the operation skillfully. Um, but being skilled at doing a radical operation doesn't mean it's a good operation. On the contrary, it may seduce you into doing it because it's fun to do quote unquote but it doesn't mean it's a good treatment but there was dr bernard fisher in pittsburgh who was challenging the received wisdom and he believed that uh, the radical mastectomy was based on a obsolete paradigm now i'll explain what the word paradigm means paradigm is a conceptual uh, model of um, what where we are at you i can see you are in the bedroom and your your area of space is closed off by four walls but many people's brains are in a box like this shut to new ideas when um the the box itself is uh, a myth it isn't a reality and there were so many outlying facts uh, about breast cancer that just refuted this model. The main, most important one was however carefully you took it away, you know, however completely you took it away. I remember surgeons coming to the bedside the next day after a, a patient's had a radical mastectomy and say, you're all right, it's been all taken away. And then Two years later, they get recurrences, and uh, in in those days, fifty percent would have been dead within ten years. Going back to the nineteen sixties, the early nineteen seventies. So, Doctor Fisher, um, in his animal experiments, showed that cancer did not spread centrifugally, uh, which encouraged the bigger the operation, the bigger the cure rate, but got into the bloodstream very early. So at the time of diagnosis, if the disease was going to have escaped, it had escaped. So the radical mastectomy was shutting the stable door after the horse had bolted. Now, there are two consequences of that. Uh, one, breast-conserving surgery, uh, providing it provided local control, would be as good, but a lot kinder than radical mastectomy. And the other consequence was that systemic therapy, medical treatment, treating the whole body would improve on cure rates. But yes, those were great ideas, but uh, Bernie Fisher was a scientist and my whole career was based on his notion of science, do the experiment. And the experiment was the randomized controlled trial. So I was one of the advocates way back in the 1970s of setting up randomized controlled trials to begin with comparing very radical to very conservative treatments and to add to the treatment drugs. My particular interest was hormone therapy, tamoxifen and other drugs of a similar nature. As a consequence of this, we reached the point, um, and I can tell you the point, it was a point, 1985, we had a world um, uh, overview, meta-analysis. We all gathered at Oxford University. We looked at all the data, and it was unequivocal that breast-conserving surgery uh, was equivalent in cure rates of radical mastectomy, but a whole deal kinder, and the use of uh, endocrine hormone therapy, tamoxifen, or chemotherapy would significantly improve survival. And that's where we arrived at in 1985, as a result of which, from that point, um, 
mortality began to plunge downwards from that single point of time, really exciting. And most, most, most countries within about five years had abandoned radical mass activists. So that happened in a, over a period of eight, 1985 to 1990. Then you might want to know what has happened since. Well, I mean, it's quite interesting. And before I talk about the next chapter, a lot of women, there's a whole psychological element. I mean, I've, you know, sadly been affected by a loss of a very good friend who did incredibly well for many, many, many years. But, you know, there's a, there's a psychological element to women thinking, well, if I have my breast removed, therefore I'm cancer free. Um, and I just wondered if, you know, obviously with the chemotherapy and the drugs, there are also, you know, horrible side effects. Um, you know, for women who are watching this, you know, and for doctors, what, what would you say about kind of dealing with that psychological aspect of women saying, well, I don't care, I still want it removed? That's a, a very good question. Um, we did a piece of work on that, precisely on that question, which has been largely ignored, but it's the, it provides the answer to your question. Uh, when I got back to London, I set up our own trial for breast conserving surgery, comparing mastectomy with lumpectomy and radiotherapy. But in addition to looking at survival, recurrence and survival, I recruited um, Leslie Fallowfield, uh, who is now Dame Professor Leslie Fallowfield, who is an expert in measuring subjective outcomes, quality of life. And we were very, very disappointed. Although the outcomes were similar uh, between the two treatments, the reason there was no improvement in quality of life was the women who had breast conserving surgery had that response. Anxiety, has it taken away enough? And we identified that as a problem. Well, way, way back, um, I'm thinking uh, probably 1990, we defined that we had a problem to solve. Mm -hmm. But what's happened now, I think, um, we're talking about an, a new generation of women coming into the cancer age. They, they have, uh, already grew, grown up during that early phase and they entered this age group where you can get breast cancer where it's just accepted yeah. a mastectomy should not be required and if i'm offered a mastectomy i should challenge that so the, the coin you know, it's flipped just like that yeah um so it's interesting you, you're talking about obviously radiation and radiotherapy and there's a, a chapter in your book chapter 11 called the golden ibex of santorini oh, yeah. um have a chapter 10 which the curability of breast cancer well you you've touched on that um and you know the birth of a juvenile sy systemic therapy um so can we just talk about those those two together sort of one leading into the other um you know a bit bit more about other treatments and you know the evidence that you know a cure for breast cancer you know might be achievable um the uh, my thesis was linked to the natural history and curability of breast cancer mm -hmm. and when i qualified um there was no evidence that uh, breast cancer could be cured because if you follow them up long enough uh they were dying what's it's very difficult to define cure. You could argue that you can cure a patient if two years after the operation is just killed by a bus. Uh, it's lived two years and then died of something else. So crudely speaking, you're cured of breast cancer if you live long enough to die of something else. Yeah. Now, what's happening, whether we're actually curing the disease, um, in, in other words, getting rid of every cancer cell in the body, or whether we're prolonging life to a point uh, that they live, will die of something else. Now, I'll come back to the last chapter in my book. This is what's happened. Yeah. Most women these days will die of something else. So the issue isn't, are they cured? <laughs> but is their life prolonged long enough to die what people say natural causes uh, and longer down the line? So it's, it's, it's a difficult concept to grasp. So for, forgive me using the, the analogy of the bus, but effectively yeah. is uh, the cure. 
so you know the golden ibex of santorini um you know the, i know this is going to lead this is leading to something very exciting and sort of breaking news which i i've known about obviously through you for many many years but the research is out um so just well, tell you know well you tell everyone well, about this it. this is almost breaking news and very exciting now you might want to know what has the golden ibex got to do with it <laughs> well it it's a good story how all this came about. Um, in uh, about 25 years ago, I'd already reached a position where I was notable, um, in that I was considered already one of the experts. Mm -hmm. And a, um, a company in America had developed a, uh, a miniature electron generator about the size of a shoebox and the uh, the owner of the company was an uh, a greek oligarch peter nomikos who amongst other things owned together with his wife the island of santorini and he came and saw me and he said um we've invented this miniature electron therapy but at the moment it's a treatment for which there's no known disease i repeat that the treatment for which there's no known disease is there any way we could use this uh, in treating cancer and a kind of light bulb went off in my uh, head and i said yeah i think so and i sketched something out on the back of an envelope and he said you must come visit us in santorini um, and um, i'd like you to meet our board so I thought, well, that must include my wife. And he said, oh, yes, of course it includes your wife. So um, me and Mrs. Baum uh, flew to the beautiful island of Santorini and joined this board meeting. And um, together we came up with the concept of how to use this device to irradiate the interior of the breast after cutting out the tumour. So after uh, the lumpectomy? Uh, yes, you do. Uh, yeah, I don't well, like the word lumpectomy, but that's what people say. Yeah. You excise the tumour, there's the bed of the tumour, and you put the device into the bed, turn it on for a short time, and that kind of sterilises the cavity, and that might be enough. Um, so I came back, and we set up a prototype. But the other important thing that's happened around about that time, I recruited a brilliant uh, young PhD student, uh, who is now a professor, J.M. Vaidia, and he did his PhD on this. And between us and with a, a radiation oncologist, Professor Jeffrey Tobias, the three of us uh, perfected a technique of delivering a blast of radiotherapy into the tumor bed at the time of surgery, um, which did not spread outside the body and didn't spread beyond a centimetre of the tumour cavity, seemed to be perfectly safe and could be used in any operating theatre, not a special unit of special room. It seemed to be safe. We did pilot studies. We then did other studies, uh, uh, adding external beam radiotherapy uh, as well. And then in the end, in the year 2000, 20 years ago, we launched the clinical trial comparing this technique, one shot interoperative radiotherapy, which lasts about 30 minutes at the time of surgery, compared with what was then the conventional seven weeks radiotherapy. Every day, five days a week for seven weeks. In fairness, they have now shrunk that down to three weeks. So modern techniques, it can be done in three weeks. So the issue is, can it be get over and done with at the time of surgery, or is it better to have uh, three weeks of external being ready therapy? Now, uh, there's lots of nuances and lots of uh, difficult statistics to understand, but we published the first uh, results uh, six years ago. No, the, eight years ago. That's right, it's 20 years I follow up. And everyone said it's too soon, it's too early, it's premature. So we thought, okay, we'll let it mature. 
And we ended up with um, a group of uh, more than 2,000 patients from 11 different countries, um, randomized between these two regimens. And um, average follow-up 12 years, maximum follow-up 19 years. And the results were published in the British Medical Journal last, last month. And it was, uh, the results are very simple. Um, local occurrence in the breast that uh, we take five year cutoff when most events are going to occur for local occurrence. At five years, there's 1% local occurrence with the external being conventional and 2%. So it's an extra 1% of a local occurrence. Now, the critics will say that's a 200% increase, a doubling the increase. And that's, be careful, that's called relative risk. One versus two, two is two times one, but it's actually a 1% risk, additional risk. But much more important than that, women are concerned about preserving the breast. And we talk about mastectomy-free survival. And going out to uh, 12 to 20 years, the same number of women have their breasts preserved long term, whichever the thing. So that's most local recurrence, mastectomy free survival, all cancer, breast cancer deaths the same. But the extraordinary thing that we picked up is this intraoperative technique protects the heart and the lungs from the rare toxic effects of whole breast radiation. And there's this, uh, uh, a modest but significant reduction in deaths from other causes other than breast cancer. Um, there's just one caveat, and this has led to a lot of argument. The novel intervention was uh, not just intraoperative radiotherapy, it's what we call risk adapted. But to enter the trial, you have to have uh, evidence of a good prognosis breast cancer. And, that accounts for about 60% of all breast cancers coming with a good prognosis. If at the final pathology, the original pathologist got it a little wrong, then we would be allowed to uh, add an external beam. So that was the, the, the regimen, and uh, that would be needed in about 20% of cases. So offering this, um, at least 80% of women are avoiding. Now, you would think, this would be a good choice and that given the information I've given you most women would uh, want it. Mm -hmm. um, we've encountered incredible hostility from the uh, radi radiation oncology uh, groups um, and in fact the opinion is more or less divided and I think that divided opinion for and against, it, to me, it's nothing to do with uncertainty about the data. The data is secure. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we even did a um, decision aid for patients uh, using a sp spotograph to show exactly what it does. I think it's ideological. And I, I think uh, the conventional radiotherapists still have the ideology, ideology that the whole breast must be treated if, in case you miss little bits outside the tumor bed. I mean, for me as a layperson, it sounds like a no-brainer. Would I rather go every day for three to six weeks to have radiation, or would I rather just have it over and done with, you know, <coughs> shot and done with it, and, and I can get on with my recovery? So, we, well, obviously, this we could talk about this for hours, and I'm sure there are possibly political, political issues and whatever else surrounding it, but you know it's absolutely fantastic it's obviously a huge breakthrough i know it's not available for every woman of course not it's you know it's got to be done case by case and um only certain cancers you know i assume will be re able to have this treatment but i wanted to talk very briefly because i know we don't have a lot of time because um that aside as uh, something just fantastic to know exists um, I have to also rewind a bit because as a woman who's just turned 50, I got my first mammogram screening letter through the post. And most people watching this will be horrified to know that I've thrown it in the bin 
um, the first time and the second time and the third time and I've actually had another letter saying are you sure and I've said yes thank you I'm sure now most women watching this would be absolutely horrified and saying are you mad uh, but I'm obviously your daughter and you know there's a few things that I've had many years to debate screening with you um, and as someone who set up breast cancer screening and has spent a long time now trying to shut it down will you explain we don't have that long you know you know talk to us about you know the screening paradox which is your actually the chapter one of your chapters chapter 12 yeah yeah um there's a kind of cliche um, almost a mantra catch it early save a life and i personally think that way of thinking has set the subject about 50 years for every complex problem, there's a simple solution and it's wrong. Now, um, in 1987, I was given the role to set up the first screening unit in the southeast of England. It was based at Camberwell Green and King's College Hospital. And I was very proud that we completed all the work within one year and it was opened in 1988. So I was one of the midwives of breast cancer screening, and I served on the committee for seven years. And as more and more data came in, I could see it wasn't living up to its promise. And it just, the data got worse and worse and worse. And a good scientist changes his mind when the data changes. It's not a U-turn, you know, you, you criticize the PM of a U-turn as if it was a bad thing. It's a good thing. The data changes, you change your mind. So cutting a long story short, we now know that breast cancer screening does not save lives. Watch my lips. Breast cancer screening is marketed as it saves lives. It doesn't. For every, and the reason it doesn't is for every breast cancer death avoided, there is one extra death from other causes, downstream effect of uh, the, the consequences of screening. And the reason for that is up to 50% of screen detected cancers are not programmed to progress. They, we know, how we know is another lecture, but we know that at least half of them and we don't know which half, but numerically half them would never progress to threaten a woman's life. So identifying them, all that does, doesn't save a life. It causes, it causes surgery and it causes radiotherapy. And as a result of which, uh, other women will die because of the toxicity of the treatment. They're rare, but say avoiding a breast cancer death from screening is very rare. And the reason for that is screening is good at picking up good cancers, slow growing cancers. And the ones that are threatening slip through the net between one screen and another. And many of us now, I mean, there's a, there's a whole international grouping that meets regularly on uh, email, um, have reached the opinion screening should be shut down. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's not being shut down is political. Well, I think, yes, I mean, it, it, you know, from, from my point of view, if you took all the money that has, is pumped into screening and instead pump that into research and better treatments, I think, you know, with my simple brain, I think that we would be far better off. I mean, the question that I know everyone is going to ask now, and I'm going to ask you, even though I know the answer, is what should we do then when we get that letter? Well, what should we do? I mean, you hear all the sort of the pink ribbon brigade who are marching and walking 26 miles for, you know, in their bras for breast cancer and, and sort of copper, you know, copper feel, you know, all these sort of organizations that women. Oh, what copper, copper what? There, there's an organization called Copper Feel and, you know, and it's about, you know, checking it's your breast. C-O-P-E-R. P-P-A. Um, but I don't want to sort of... <laughs> I don't want to um, talk about what other people are doing because everyone will have different opinions, but obviously I trust yours enormously, so do millions of women around the world. But women will be saying, well, what do I do then? Do I look for a lump? Does my doctor look for a lump? Does my yeah. daddy, or, or what do I do? 
Uh, well, <laughs> the answer to that, the, the quick answer, and I wouldn't say this, who says you have to do anything? Yeah. The idea, who says you have to do anything? The women who do have to do something are those with a very bad family history. And what they need is genetic testing, not screening, genetic testing. So a bad family history would be a mother, a grandmother, a great grandmother, or is it a mother? Uh, first, and mother? Uh, first degree, second degree relatives, okay, yes. Well. They're quite easily identified, these high risk women. And, um, and then if you're uh, Ashkenazi Jew, that increases the risk it, it itself as well. Um, but the real point is why are you specifically worried about breast cancer? Well, that it leads is... me, I'm going to interrupt because that leads me into my last question, which is chapter 16. Oh, um, right. Which is uh, entitled A New Model of Healthcare for Women. Yes. Um, so, yeah, exactly. Why should oh. we, yeah. Well, uh, one thing I've learned uh, over my years practicing, uh, looking after the health of women, what is important to me is the totality of women's health. Totality, not single issue fanaticism. And too many breast cancer specialists are single issue fanatics. You've got to look at the totality. And the totality of women's health is, first of all, look at the ranking of causes of death. Mm -hmm. Commonest cause of death is dementia amongst women. Number seven in the league is breast cancer. So there's all these other things which are actually more important than worrying about breast cancer. Now, I know um, you're going to interview Avram Blooming about HRT. Well, the, some of these other more common causes of death than breast cancer can be helped with HRT, but that is another lecture. So what I would uh, recommend your viewers, your followers, is start worrying about breast cancer. If by chance you come across it, it will be treated with breast conserving treatment and the drug therapy will be in all likelihood would keep you alive until you die of something else. That's what the pattern now. So if you want to worry about something, worry about your lungs and your heart don't smoke keep your weight down exercise your brain that's what you should be doing not driving yourself crazy with uh, the worry about breast cancer with the only caveat your family history um, and a couple of last words because i know some people will say and you know obviously as i've said i've you know had experience myself sadly there's always going to be very well-meaning friends who say, you know, you're a maverick, what rubbish, you know, I've lost a friend um, or, you know, screening saved my friend's life or my life and they just will not listen. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about informed decision with your doctor. What would you be your sort of last sort of words of advice to women who, you know, just genuinely don't know what to do and are just put, pulled between yeah. what the media is saying, the friends are saying, and what the doctors are saying. Um, funnily, you should say this. Uh, the, the, the patient or the woman who says, uh, screening saved my life, or uh, if only my friend had had screening, uh, we are debating it in our specialist group. How do you word this? Mm -hmm. To tell a woman, oh, screening saved my life, oh, it, and you say, no, it didn't. You can't say that. Yeah. So the only way around this problem is, is education, uh, not bullying, uh, respectful education. And I think if women are worried about the, the risk of breast cancer um, and what to do about it, there are many centres around the country that offer risk assessment, risk management. So I think the correct answer to that, if you think you're at high risk, go and see a specialist who has an algorithm for estimating your risk and then advising on the management of that risk. And that, uh, each woman is different. And using these algorithms, we can individualize that type of advice. Well, I, I think that's brilliant and fascinating. And I hope it helps women. I think the whole point of setting up this platform, um, you know, was obviously inspired by you because I want to be able to carry your baton to help more women live longer and better quality of lives. Um, and most importantly, give them, you know, really simple, easy to understand evidence-based information so they can then 
take this with them to the doctor and, and make an intelligent decision together rather than, you know, listening to the media or, or well-meaning friends. Um, you know, so obviously, you know, thank you, you know, for, you know, having this conversation with me and, and with everyone else. And as, as um, Dad has touched on, we are going to, um, in a couple of weeks' time on October the 18th, um, Dr. Avram Blooming, who wrote the book Estrogen Matters, I'm going to be interviewing him because... Um, again, the whole fear mongering or scaremongering, I should say, around HRT and breast cancer, we're going to dispel those myths and most importantly, reassure women. Um, and obviously, you know, in chapter 13 of your book, there is um, a whole section about the HRT paradox, estrogens are good for you. Um, so thank you very much. And I hope that's been really helpful for everyone. And obviously, we'll be sharing this widely. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.